May I, monsieur, offer my services without running the risk of intruding? I fear you may not be able to make yourself understood by the worthy ape who presides over the fate of this establishment. In fact, he speaks nothing but Dutch. Unless you authorize me to plead your case, he will not guess that you want gin. There, I dare hope he understood me. That nod must mean that he yields to my arguments. He is taking steps. Indeed, he is making haste with prudent deliberation. You are lucky. He didn't grunt. When he refuses to serve someone, he merely grunts. No one insists. Being master of one's moods is the privilege of the larger animals. Now I shall withdraw, monsieur. Happy to have been of help to you. Thank you. I'd accept if I were sure of not being a nuisance. You are too kind. Then I shall bring my glass over beside yours. You are right. His silence is deafening. It's the silence of the primeval forest, heavy with threats. At times I am amazed by his obstinacy in snubbing civilized languages. His business consists in entertaining sailors of all nationalities in this Amsterdam bar, which for that matter he named, no one knows why, Mexico City. With such duties, wouldn't you think there might be some fear that his ignorance would be awkward? Fancy the Cro-Magnon man lodged in the Tower of Babel. He would certainly feel out of his element. Yet this one is not aware of his exile. He goes his own sweet way, and nothing touches him. One of the rare sentences I have ever heard from his mouth proclaimed that you could take it or leave it. What did one have to take or leave? Doubtless our friend himself. I confess I am drawn by such creatures who are all of a piece. Anyone who has considerably meditated on man, by profession or vocation, is led to feel nostalgia for the primates. They at least don't have any ulterior motives. Our host, to tell the truth, has some, although he harbors them deep within him. As a result of not understanding what is said in his presence, he has adopted a distrustful disposition. Whence that look of touchy dignity as if he at least suspected that all is not perfect among men. That disposition makes it less easy to discuss anything with him that does not concern his business. Notice, for instance, on the back wall above his head, that empty rectangle marking the place where a picture has been taken down. Indeed, there was a picture there, and a particularly interesting one, a real masterpiece. Well, I was present when the master of the house received it, and when he gave it up. In both cases he did so with the same distrust, after weeks of rumination. In that regard, you must admit that society has somewhat spoiled the frank simplicity of his nature. Mind you, I am not judging him. I consider his distrust justified, and should be inclined to share it, if, as you see, my communicative nature were not opposed to this. I am talkative, alas, and make friends easily. Although I know how to keep my distance, I seize any and every opportunity. When I used to live in France, were I to meet an intelligent man, I immediately sought his company. If that be foolish, ah, I see you smile at that use of the subjunctive. I confess my weakness for that mood and for fine speech in general, a weakness that I criticize in myself, believe me. I am well aware that an addiction to silk underwear does not necessarily imply that one's feet are dirty. Nonetheless, style, like sheer silk, too often hides eczema. My consolation is to tell myself that, after all, those who murder the language are not pure either. Why, yes, let's have another gin. Are you staying long in Amsterdam? A beautiful city, isn't it? Fascinating? There's an adjective I haven't heard in some time. Not since leaving Paris, in fact, years ago. But the heart has its own memory, and I have forgotten nothing of our beautiful capital, nor of its quays. Paris is a real trompe l'oeil, a magnificent stage setting inhabited by four million silhouettes, nearly five million at the last census. Why, they must have multiplied. And that wouldn't surprise me. It always seemed to me that our fellow citizens had two passions, ideas and fornication, without rhyme or reason, so to speak. Still, let us take care not to condemn them. They are not the only ones, for all Europe is in the same boat. I sometimes think of what future historians will say of us. A single sentence will suffice for modern man. He fornicated and read the papers. After that vigorous definition, the subject will be, 
if I may say so, exhausted. Oh, not the Dutch. They are much less modern. They have time. Just look at them. What do they do? Well, these gentlemen over here live off the labors of those ladies over there. All of them, moreover, both male and female, are very middle-class creatures who have come here as usual, out of mythomania or stupidity, through too much or too little imagination, in short. From time to time these gentlemen indulge in a little knife or revolver play, but don't get the idea that they're keen on it. Their role calls for it, that's all, and they are dying of fright as they shoot it out. Nevertheless, I find them more moral than the others, those who kill in the bosom of the family by attrition. Haven't you noticed that our society is organized for this kind of liquidation? You have heard, of course, of those tiny fish in the rivers of Brazil that attack the unwary swimmer by thousands and with swift little nibbles clean him up in a few minutes, leaving only an immaculate skeleton. Well, that's what their organization is. Do you want a good clean life, like everybody else? You say yes, of course. How can one say no? Okay, you'll be cleaned up. Here's a job, a family, and organized leisure activities. And the little teeth attack the flesh, right down to the bone. But I am unjust. I shouldn't say their organization. It is ours, after all. It's a question of which will clean up the other. Here is our gin at last. To your prosperity. Yes, the ape opened his mouth to call me doctor. In these countries everyone is a doctor or a professor. They like showing respect, out of kindness and out of modesty. Among them, at least, spitefulness is not a national institution. Besides, I am not a doctor. If you want to know, I was a lawyer before coming here. Now I am a judge penitent. But allow me to introduce myself. Jean-Baptiste Clemence, at your service. Pleased to know you. You are in business, no doubt. In a way, excellent reply. Judicious, too. In all things, we are merely in a way. Now allow me to play the detective. You are my age, in a way, with the sophisticated eye of the man in his forties who has seen everything, in a way. You are well-dressed, in a way, that is, as people are in our country, and your hands are smooth. Hence a bourgeois, in a way, but a cultured bourgeois. Smiling at the use of the subjunctive, in fact, proves your culture twice over because you recognize it to begin with, and then because you feel superior to it. Lastly, I amuse you. And be it said without vanity, this implies in you a certain open-mindedness. Consequently, you are in a way... But no matter. Professions interest me less than sects. Allow me to ask you two questions and don't answer if you consider them indiscreet. Do you have any possessions? Some. Good. Have you shared them with the poor? No? Then you are what I call a Sadducee. If you are not familiar with the Scriptures, I admit that this won't help you. But it does help you? So you know the Scripturees? Decidedly, you interest me. As for me, well, judge for yourself. By my stature, my shoulders, and this face that I have often been told was shy, I rather look like a rugby player, don't I? But if I am judged by my conversation, I have to be granted a little subtlety. The Camille that provided the hair for my overcoat was probably Mangi, yet my nails are manicured. I, too, am sophisticated, and yet I confide in you without caution on the sole basis of your looks. Finally, despite my good manners and my fine speech, I frequent sailors' bars in the Zedek. Come on, give up. My profession is double, that's all, like the human being. I have already told you, I am a judge penitent. Only one thing is simple in my case. I possess nothing. Yes, I was rich. No, I shared nothing with the poor. What does that prove? That I, too, was a Sadducee. Oh, do you hear the foghorns in the harbor? There'll be fog tonight on the Zuider Zee. You're leaving already? Forgive me for having perhaps detained you. No, I beg you, I won't let you pay. I am at home at Mexico City, and have been particularly pleased to receive you here. I shall certainly be here tomorrow, as I am every evening, and I shall be pleased to accept your invitation. Your way back? Well, 
But if you don't have any objection, the easiest thing would be for me to accompany you as far as the harbor. Thence, by going around the Jewish quarter, you'll find those fine avenues with their parade of streetcars full of flowers and thundering sounds. Your hotel is on one of them, the Damrak. You first, please. I live in the Jewish quarter, or what was called so, until our Hitlerian brethren made room. What a clean-up! Seventy-five thousand Jews deported or assassinated. That's real vacuum-cleaning. I admire that diligence, that methodical patience. When one has no character, one has to apply a method. Here it did wonders incontrovertibly, and I am living on the site of one of the greatest crimes in history. Perhaps that's what helps me to understand the ape and his distrust. Thus I can struggle against my natural inclination, carrying me toward fraternizing. When I see a new face, something in me sounds the alarm. Slow, danger, even when the attraction is strongest, I am on my guard. Do you know that in my little village, during a punitive operation, a German officer courteously asked an old woman to please choose which of her two sons would be shot as a hostage? Choose. Can you imagine that? That one? No, this one. And see him go. Let's not dwell on it, but believe me, monsieur, any surprise is possible. I knew a pure heart who rejected distrust. He was a pacifist and libertarian, and loved all humanity and the animals with an equal love. An exceptional soul, that's certain. Well, during the last wars of religion in Europe he had retired to the country. He had written on his threshold, Wherever you come from, come in and be welcome. Who do you think answered that noble invitation? The militia, who made themselves at home and disemboweled him. Oh, pardon, madame. But she didn't understand a word of it anyway. All these people, eh? Out so late despite this rain which hasn't let up for days. Fortunately, there is gin, the sole glimmer of light in this darkness. Do you feel the golden copper-colored light it kindles in you? I like walking through the city of an evening in the warmth of gin. I walk for nights on end. I dream or talk to myself interminably. Yes, like this evening. And I fear making your head swim somewhat. Thank you. You are most courteous. But it's the overflow. As soon as I open my mouth, sentences start to flow. Besides, this country inspires me. I like these people swarming on the sidewalks, wedged into a little space of houses and canals, hemmed in by fogs, cold lands, and the sea steaming like a wet wash. I like them, for they are double. They are here and elsewhere. Yes, indeed, from hearing their heavy tread on the damp pavement, from seeing them move heavily between their shops full of gilded herrings and jewels the color of dead leaves, you probably think they are here this evening. You are like everybody else. You take these good people for a tribe of syndics and merchants counting their gold crowns with their chances of eternal life, whose only lyricism consists in, occasionally, without doffing their broad-brimmed hats, taking anatomy lessons. You are wrong. They walk along with us, to be sure, and yet see where their heads are, in that fog compounded of neon, gin, and mint emanating from the shop signs above them. Holland is a dream, monsieur, a dream of gold and smoke, smokier by day, more gilded by night. And night and day that dream is peopled with Lohengrins like these, dreamily riding their black bicycles with high handlebars, Funereal swans constantly drifting throughout the whole land, around the seas, along the canals. Their heads in their copper-colored clouds they dream, they cycle in circles, they pray, somnambulists in the fog's gilded incense. They have ceased to be here. They have gone thousands of miles away, toward Java, the distant isle. They pray to those grimacing gods of Indonesia, with which they have decorated all their shop windows and which at this moment are floating aimlessly above us before alighting, like sumptuous monkeys, on the signs and stepped roofs to remind these homesick colonials that Holland is not only the Europe of merchants, but also the sea, the sea that leads to Chipango, and to those islands where men die mad and happy. But I am letting myself go. I am pleading a case. Forgive me. Habit, monsieur. Vocation. Also the desire to make you fully understand this city and the heart of things. 
for we are at the heart of things here. Have you noticed that Amsterdam's concentric canals resemble the circles of hell? The middle-class hell, of course, peopled with bad dreams. When one comes from the outside, as one gradually goes through those circles, life, and hence its crimes, becomes denser, darker. Here we are in the last circle. The circle of the... Ah, you know that! By heaven you become harder to classify. But you understand, then, why I can say that the center of things is here, although we stand at the tip of the continent. A sensitive man grasps such oddities. In any case, the newspaper readers and the fornicators can go no further. They come from the four corners of Europe and stop facing the inner sea on the drab strand. They listen to the foghorns, vainly try to make out the silhouettes of boats in the fog, then turn back over the canals and go home through the rain. Chilled to the bone, they come and ask in all languages for gin at Mexico City. There I wait for them. Till tomorrow, then, monsieur et cher compatriote. No, you will easily find your way now. I'll leave you near this bridge. I never cross a bridge at night. It's the result of a vow. Suppose, after all, that someone should jump in the water. One of two things. Either you do likewise to fish him out and, in cold weather, you run a great risk, or you forsake him there and suppress dives, sometimes leave one strangely aching. Good night. What? Those ladies behind those windows? Dream, monsieur. Cheap dream. A trip to the Indies. Those persons perfume themselves with spices. You go in, they draw the curtains, and the navigation begins. The gods come down onto the naked bodies, and the islands are set adrift, lost souls crowned with the tousled hair of palm trees in the wind. Try it. What is a judge penitent? Ah, I intrigued you with that business. I meant no harm by it, believe me, and I can explain myself more clearly. In a way, that even belongs to my official duties. But first, I must set forth a certain number of facts that will help you to understand my story. A few years ago, I was a lawyer in Paris, and, indeed, a rather well-known lawyer. Of course, I didn't tell you my real name. I had a specialty, noble cases, widows and orphans. As the saying goes, I don't know why, because there are improper widows and ferocious orphans. Yet it was enough for me to sniff the slightest scent of victim on a defendant for me to swing into action. And what action? A real tornado. My heart was on my sleeve. You would really have thought that justice slept with me every night. I am sure you would have admired the rightness of my tone, the appropriateness of my emotion, the persuasion and warmth, the restrained indignation of my speeches before the court. Nature favored me as to my physique, and the noble attitude comes effortlessly. Furthermore, I was buoyed up by two sincere feelings, the satisfaction of being on the right side of the bar and an instinctive scorn for judges in general. That scorn, after all, wasn't perhaps so instinctive. I know now that it had its reasons. But, seen from the outside, it looked rather like a passion. It can't be denied that, for the moment at least, we have to have judges, don't we? However, I could not understand how a man could offer himself to perform such a surprising function. I accepted the fact because I saw it, but rather as I accepted locusts. With this difference, that the invasions of those orthoptera never brought me a son, whereas I earned my living by carrying on a dialogue with people I scorned. But after all, I was on the right side. That was enough to satisfy my conscience. The feeling of the law, the satisfaction of being right, the joy of self-esteem, cher monsieur, are powerful incentives for keeping us upright or keeping us moving forward. On the other hand, if you deprive men of them, you transform them into dogs frothing with rage. How many crimes committed merely because their authors could not endure being wrong? I once knew a manufacturer who had a perfect wife, admired by all, and yet he deceived her. That man was literally furious to be in the wrong, to be blocked from receiving or granting himself a certificate of virtue. The more virtues his wife manifested, the more vexed he became. Eventually, living in the wrong became unbearable to him. What do you think he did then? He gave up deceiving her? Not at all. He killed her. That is how I entered into relations with him. My situation was more enviable. 
Not only did I run no risk of joining the criminal camp, in particular I had no chance of killing my wife, being a bachelor, but I even took up their defense, on the sole condition that they should be noble murderers, as others are noble savages. The very manner in which I conducted that defense gave me great satisfactions. I was truly above reproach in my professional life. I never accepted a bribe, it goes without saying, and I never stooped either to any shady proceedings. And this is even rarer. I never deigned to flatter any journalist to get him on my side, nor any civil servant whose friendship might be useful to me. I even had the luck of seeing the Legion of Honor offered to me two or three times and of being able to refuse it with a discreet dignity in which I found my true reward. Finally, I never charged the poor a fee and never boasted of it. Don't think for a moment, cher monsieur, that I am bragging. I take no credit for this. The avidity which in our society substitutes for ambition has always made me laugh. I was aiming higher. You will see that the expression is exact in my case, but you can already imagine my satisfaction. I enjoyed my own nature to the fullest, and we all know that there lies happiness, although to soothe one another mutually, we occasionally pretend to condemn such joys as selfishness. At least I enjoyed that part of my nature, which reacted so appropriately to the widow and orphan, that eventually, through exercise, it came to dominate my whole life. For instance, I loved to help blind people cross streets. From as far away as I could see a cane hesitating on the edge of a sidewalk, I would rush forward, sometimes only a second ahead of another charitable hand already outstretched, snatch the blind person from any solicitude but mine, and lead him gently but firmly along the crosswalk, among the traffic obstacles toward the refuge of the other sidewalk, where we would separate with a mutual emotion. In the same way, I always enjoyed giving directions in the street, obliging with a light, lending a hand to heavy push carts, pushing a stranded car, buying a paper from the Salvation Army lass, or flowers from the old peddler, though I knew she stole them from the Montparnasse Cemetery. I also liked, and this is harder to say, I liked to give alms. A very Christian friend of mine admitted that one's initial feeling on seeing a beggar approach one's house is unpleasant. Well, with me, it was worse. I used to exult. But let's not dwell on this. Let us speak rather of my courtesy. It was famous and unquestionable. Indeed, good manners provided me with great delights. If I had the luck, certain mornings, to give up my seat in the bus or subway to someone who obviously deserved it, to pick up some object, an old lady would drop it and return it to her. With a smile I knew well, or merely to forfeit my taxi to someone in a greeter hurry than I, it was a red-letter day. I even rejoiced, I must admit, those days when the transport system being on strike, I had a chance to load into my car at the bus stop some of my unfortunate fellow citizens unable to get home, giving up my seat in the theater to allow a couple to sit together, hoisting a girl's suitcases onto the rack in a train. These were all deeds I performed more often than others because I paid more attention to the opportunities and was better able to relish the pleasure they give. Consequently, I was considered generous, and so I was. I gave a great deal in public and in private, but far from suffering when I had to give up an object or a sum of money, I derived constant pleasures from this, among them a sort of melancholy which occasionally rose within me at the thought of the sterility of those gifts and the probable ingratitude that would follow. I even took such pleasure in giving that I hated to be obliged to do so. Exactitude in money matters bored me to death and I conformed ungraciously. I had to be the master of my liberalities. These are just little touches but they will help you grasp the constant delights I experienced in my life, and especially in my profession. Being stopped in the corridor of the law courts by the wife of a defendant, you represented out of justice or pity alone, I mean without charge, hearing that woman whisper that nothing, no, nothing, could ever repay what you had done for them, replying that it was quite natural, that anyone would have done as much, even offering some financial help to tide over the bad days ahead. Then, 
in order to cut the effusions short and preserve their proper resonance, kissing the hand of a poor woman and breaking away, believe me, cher monsieur, this is achieving more than the vulgar, ambitious man and rising to that supreme summit where virtue is its own reward. Let's pause on these heights. Now you understand what I meant when I spoke of aiming higher. I was talking, it so happens, of those supreme summits, the only places I can really live. Yes, I have never felt comfortable except in lofty places. Even in the details of daily life I needed to feel above. I preferred the bus to the subway, open carriages to taxis, terraces to closed-in places. An enthusiast for sport planes, in which one's head is in the open. On boats, I was the eternal pacer of the top deck. In the mountains, I used to flee the deep valleys for the passes and plateaus. I was the man of the mesas, at least. If fate had forced me to choose between work at a lathe or as a roofer, don't worry, I'd have chosen the roofs and become acquainted with dizziness. Coal bins, ship's holds, undergrounds, grottos, pits were repulsive to me. I had even developed a special loathing for speleologists, who had the nerve to fill the front page of our newspapers, and whose records nauseated me. Striving to reach elevation minus 800 at the risk of getting one's head caught in a rocky funnel, a siphon, as those fools say, seemed to me the exploit of perverted or traumatized characters. There was something criminal underlying it, a natural balcony fifteen hundred feet above a sea still visible bathed in sunlight, on the other hand, was the place where I could breathe most freely, especially if I were alone, well above the human ants. I could readily understand why sermons, decisive preachings, and fire miracles took place on accessible heights. In my opinion, no one meditated in cellars or prison cells, unless they were situated in a tower with a broad view. One just became moldy, and I could understand that man who, having entered holy orders, gave up the frock because his cell, instead of overlooking a vast landscape as he expected, looked out on a wall. Rest assured that as far as I was concerned I did not grow moldy. At every hour of the day within myself and among others I would scale the heights and light conspicuous fires, and a joyful greeting would rise toward me. Thus at least I took pleasure in life and in my own excellence. My profession satisfied most happily that vocation for summits. It cleansed me of all bitterness toward my neighbor, whom I always obligated without ever owing him anything. It set me above the judge whom I judged in turn, above the defendant whom I forced to gratitude. Just weigh this, cher monsieur. I lived with impunity. I was concerned in no judgment. I was not on the floor of the courtroom, but somewhere in the flies like those gods that are brought down by machinery from time to time to transfigure the action and give it its meaning. After all, living aloft is still the only way of being seen and hailed by the largest number. Besides, some of my good criminals had killed in obedience to the same feeling. Reading the newspapers afterward, in the sorry condition in which they then were, doubtless brought them a sort of unhappy compensation. Like many men, they had no longer been able to endure anonymity, and that impatience had contributed to leading them to unfortunate extremities. To achieve notoriety, it is enough, after all, to kill one's concierge. Unhappily, this is usually an ephemeral reputation. So many concierges are there who deserve and receive the knife. Crime constantly monopolizes the headlines, but the criminal appears there only fugitively, to be replaced at once. In short, such brief triumphs cost too dear. Defending our unfortunate aspirants, after a reputation amounted, on the other hand, to becoming really well known, at the same time and in the same places, but by more economical means. Consequently, this encouraged me to making more meritorious efforts so that they would pay as little as possible. What they were paying they were doing so to some extent in my place. The indignation, talent, and emotion I expended on them washed away, in return, any debt I might feel toward them. The judges punished and the defendants expiated, while I, free of any duty, shielded from judgment as from penalty, I freely held sway bathed in a light as of Eden. Indeed, wasn't that Eden, cher monsieur? 
no intermediary between life and me. Such was my life. I never had to learn how to live. In that regard, I already knew everything at birth. Some people's problem is to protect themselves from men, or at least to come to terms with them. In my case, the understanding was already established, familiar when it was appropriate, silent when necessary, capable of a free and easy manner as readily as of dignity, I was always in harmony. Hence my popularity was great, and my successes in society innumerable. I was acceptable in appearance. I revealed myself to be both a tireless dancer and an unobtrusively learned man. I managed to love simultaneously, and this is not easy, women and justice. I indulged in sports and the fine arts. In short, I'll not go on for fear you might suspect me of self-flattery. But just imagine, I beg you, a man at the height of his powers, in perfect health, generously gifted, skilled in bodily exercises as in those of the mind, neither rich nor poor, sleeping well, and fundamentally pleased with himself without showing this otherwise than by a felicitous sociability. You will readily see how I can speak, without immodesty, of a successful life. Yes, few creatures were more natural than I. I was altogether in harmony with life, fitting into it from top to bottom without rejecting any of its ironies, its grandeur, or its servitude. In particular the flesh, matter, the physical in short, which disconcerts or discourages so many men in love or in solitude without enslaving me, brought me steady joys. I was made to have a body, whence that harmony in me, that relaxed mastery that people felt, even to telling me sometimes that it helped them in life. Hence my company was in demand. Often, for instance, people thought they had met me before. Life, its creatures and its gifts, offered themselves to me, and I accepted such marks of homage with a kindly pride. To tell the truth, just from being so fully and simply a man, I looked upon myself as something of a superman. I was of respectable but humble birth, my father was an officer, and yet, certain mornings, let me confess it humbly, I felt like a king's son, or a burning bush. It was not a matter, mind you, of the certainty I had of being more intelligent than everyone else. Besides, such certainty is of no consequence because so many imbeciles share it. No, as a result of being showered with blessings, I felt, I hesitate to admit, marked out. Personally marked out, among all, for that long and uninterrupted success. This, after all, was a result of my modesty. I refused to attribute that success to my own merits, and could not believe that the conjunction in a single person of such different and such extreme virtues was the result of chance alone. This is why, in my happy life, I felt somehow that that happiness was authorized by some higher decree. When I add that I had no religion, you can see even better how extraordinary that conviction was. Whether ordinary or not, it served for some time to raise me above the daily routine, and I literally soared for a period of years, for which, to tell the truth, I still long in my heart of hearts. I soared until the evening when... But no, that's another matter and it must be forgotten. Anyway, I am perhaps exaggerating. I was at ease in everything, to be sure, but at the same time satisfied with nothing. Each joy made me desire another. I went from festivity to festivity. On occasion I danced for nights on end, ever made her about people and life. At times, late on those nights when the dancing, the slight intoxication, my wild enthusiasm, Everyone's violent unrestraint would fill me with a tired and overwhelmed rapture. It would seem to me, at the breaking point of fatigue and for a second's flash, that at last I understood the secret of creatures and of the world. But my fatigue would disappear the next day, and with it the secret. I would rush forth anew. I ran on like that, always heaped with favors, never satiated, without knowing where to stop until the day until the evening rather when the music stopped and the lights went out. The gay party at which I had been so happy. But allow me to call on our friend the primate. Nod your head to thank him, and above all drink up with me. I need your understanding. I see that that declaration amazes you. Have you never suddenly needed understanding, help, friendship? Yes, of course. 
I have learned to be satisfied with understanding. It is found more readily, and besides, it's not binding. I beg you to believe in my sympathetic understanding, in the inner discourse always precedes immediately, and now, let's turn to other matters. It's a board chairman's emotion. It comes cheap, after catastrophes. Friendship is less simple. It is long and hard to obtain, but when one has it there's no getting rid of it. One simply has to cope with it. Don't think for a minute that your friends will telephone you every evening, as they ought to, in order to find out if this doesn't happen to be the evening when you are deciding to commit suicide, or simply whether you don't need company, whether you are not in a mood to go out. No, don't worry. They'll ring up the evening you are not alone when life is beautiful. As for suicide, they would be more likely to push you to it, by virtue of what you owe to yourself, according to them. May heaven protect us, cher monsieur, from being set on a pedestal by our friends, those whose duty is to love us, I mean relatives and connections, what an expression, are another matter. They find the right word, all right, and it hits the bullseye. They telephone as if shooting a rifle, and they know how to aim. Oh, the Bazanes! What? What evening? I'll get to it. Be patient with me. In a certain way, I am sticking to my subject with all that about friends and connections. You see, I've heard of a man whose friend had been imprisoned and who slept on the floor of his room every night in order not to enjoy a comfort of which his friend had been deprived. Who, cher monsieur, will sleep on the floor for us, whether I am capable of it myself? Look, I'd like to be, and I shall be. Yes, we shall all be capable of it one day, and that will be salvation. But it's not easy, for friendship is absent-minded, or at least unavailing. It is incapable of achieving what it wants. Maybe, after all, it doesn't want it enough. Maybe we don't love life enough. Have you noticed that death alone awakens our feelings? How we love the friends who have just left us. How we admire those of our teachers who have ceased to speak, their mouths filled with earth. Then the expression of admiration springs forth naturally, that admiration they were perhaps expecting from us all their lives. But do you know why we are always more just and more generous toward the dead? The reason is simple. With them there is no obligation. They leave us free, and we can take our time, fit the testimonial in between a cocktail party and a nice little mistress, in our spare time, in short. If they forced us to anything, it would be to remembering, and we have a short memory. No, it is the recently dead we love among our friends, the painful dead, our emotion, ourselves, after all. For instance, I had a friend I generally avoided. He rather bored me, and besides, he was something of a moralist. But when he was on his deathbed, I was there. Don't worry. I never missed a day. He died satisfied with me, holding both my hands. A woman who used to chase after me, and in vain, had the good sense to die young. What room in my heart at once, and when, in addition, it's a suicide. Lord, what a delightful commotion. One's telephone rings, one's heart overflows, and the intentionally short sentences yet heavy with implications, one's restrained suffering, and even, yes, a bit of self-accusation. That's the way man is, cher monsieur. He has two faces. He can't love without self-love. Notice your neighbors if perchance a death takes place in the building. They were asleep in their little routine, and suddenly, for example, the concierge dies. At once they awake, bestir themselves, get the details, commiserate. A newly dead man, and the show begins at last. They need tragedy, don't you know? It's their little transcendence, their aperitif. Moreover, is it mere chance that I should speak of a concierge? I had one, really ill-favored, malice incarnate, a monster of insignificance and rancor, who would have discouraged a Franciscan. I had even given up speaking to him, but by his mere existence he compromised my customary contentedness. He died and I went to his funeral. Can you tell me why? Anyway, the two days preceding the ceremony were full of interest. The concierge's wife was ill, lying in the single room, and near her the coffin had been set on sawhorses. Everyone had to get his mail himself. You opened the door, said Bonjour, Madame, listened to her praise of the dear departed as she pointed to him, and took your mail. 
Nothing very amusing about that, and yet the whole building passed through her room, which stank of carbolic acid, and the tenants didn't send their servants either, they came themselves to take advantage of the unexpected attraction. The servants did too, of course, but on the sly. The day of the funeral the coffin was too big for the door. Oh, my dearie, the wife said from her bed with a surprise at once delighted and grieved, how big he was. Don't worry, madame, replied the funeral director. We'll get him through edgewise and upright. He was got through upright and then laid down again, and I was the only one with a former cabaret doorman who I gathered, used to drink his Pernod every evening with the dough-parted, to go as far as the cemetery and strew flowers on a coffin of astounding luxury. Then I paid a visit to the concierge's wife to receive her thanks expressed as by a great tragedienne. Tell me, what was the reason for all that? None, except the apertif. I likewise buried an old fellow member of the lawyer's guild, a clerk to whom no one paid attention, but I always shook his hand, where I worked I used to shake everyone's hand, moreover, being doubly sure to miss no one. Without much effort, such cordial simplicity won me the popularity so necessary to my contentment. For the funeral of our clerk, the president of the guild had not gone out of his way. But I did, and on the eve of a trip, as was amply pointed out. It so happened that I knew my presence would be noticed and favorably commented on. Hence, you see, not even the snow that was falling that day made me withdraw. What? I'm getting to it, never fear. Besides, I have never left it. But let me first point out that my concierge's wife, who had gone to such an outlay for the crucifix, heavy oak, and silver handles in order to get the most out of her emotion, had shacked up a month later with an overdressed yokel proud of his singing voice. He used to beat her. Frightful screams could be heard, and immediately afterward he would open the window and give forth with his favorite song, Women, How Pretty You Are. All the same, the neighbors would say. All the same what, I ask you? All right. Appearances were against the baritone, and against the concierge's wife, too. But nothing proves that they were not in love, and nothing proves either that she did not love her husband. Moreover, when the yokel took flight, his voice and arm exhausted, she, that faithful wife, resumed her praises of the departed. After all, I know of others who have appearances on their side and are no more faithful or sincere. I knew a man who gave twenty years of his life to a scatterbrained woman, sacrificing everything to her, his friendships, his work, the very respectability of his life, and who one evening recognized that he had never loved her. He had been bored, that's all, bored like most people. Hence he had made himself out of whole cloth a life full of complications and drama. Something must happen, and that explains most human commitments. Something must happen, even loveless slavery, even war or death. Hooray, then, for funerals. But I at least didn't have that excuse. I was not bored because I was riding on the crest of the wave. On the evening I am speaking about I can say that I was even less bored than ever. And yet... You see, cher monsieur, it was a fine autumn evening, still warm in town and already damp over the Seine. Night was falling, the sky, still bright in the west, was darkening, the street lamps were glowing dimly. I was walking up the quays of the left bank toward the Pont des Arts. The river was gleaming between the stalls of the second-hand booksellers. There were but few people on the quays. Paris was already at dinner. I was treading on the dusty yellow leaves that still recalled summer, Gradually the sky was filling with stars that could be seen for a moment after leaving one street lamp and heading toward another. I enjoyed the return of silence, the evening's mildness, the emptiness of Paris. I was happy. The day had been good, a blind man, the reduced sentence I had hoped for, a cordial hand-clasp from my client, a few liberalities, and in the afternoon, a brilliant improvisation in the company of several friends on the hard-heartedness of our governing class and the hypocrisy of our leaders. I had gone up on the Pont des Arts, deserted at that hour, to look at the river that could hardly be made out. Now night had come. Facing the statue of the Vert Galant, I dominated the island. I felt rising within me a vast feeling of power, and, 
I don't know how to express it, of completion, which cheered my heart. I straightened up and was about to light a cigarette, the cigarette of satisfaction, when, at that very moment, a laugh burst out behind me. Taken by surprise, I suddenly wheeled around, there was no one there. I stepped to the railing, no barge or boat. I turned back toward the island and again heard the laughter behind me, a little farther off as if it were going downstream. I stood there motionless. The sound of the laughter was decreasing, but I could still hear it distinctly behind me, come from nowhere unless from the water. At the same time I was aware of the rapid beating of my heart. Please don't misunderstand me. There was nothing mysterious about that laugh. It was a good, hearty, almost friendly laugh, which re-established the proper proportions. Soon I heard nothing more, anyway. I returned to the Keys, went up the Rue Dauphine, bought some cigarettes I didn't need at all. I was dazed and had trouble breathing. That evening I rang up a friend who wasn't at home. I was hesitating about going out when suddenly I heard laughter under my windows. I opened them. On the sidewalk, in fact, some youths were loudly saying good night. I shrugged my shoulders as I closed the windows. After all, I had a brief to study. I went into the bathroom to drink a glass of water. My reflection was smiling in the mirror, but it seemed to me that my smile was double. What? Forgive me, I was thinking of something else. I'll see you again tomorrow, probably. Tomorrow, yes, that's right. No, no, I can't stay. Besides, I am called in consultation by that brown bear of a man you see over there. A decent fellow, for sure, whom the police are meanly persecuting out of sheer perversity. You think he looks like a killer? Rest assured that his actions conform to his looks. He burgles likewise, and you will be surprised to learn that that caveman is specialized in the art trade. In Holland, everyone is a specialist in paintings and in tulips. This one, with his modest mien, is the author of the most famous theft of a painting. Which one? I may tell you. Don't be surprised at my knowledge. Although I am a judge penitent, I have my sideline here. I am the legal counselor of these good people. I studied the laws of the country and built up a clientele in this quarter where diplomas are not required. It wasn't easy, but I inspire confidence, don't I? I have a good, hearty laugh and an energetic handshake, and those are trump cards. Besides, I settled a few difficult cases out of self-interest to begin with and later out of conviction. If pimps and thieves were invariably sentenced, all decent people would get to thinking they themselves were constantly innocent, cher monsieur. And in my opinion, all right, all right, I'm coming. That's what must be avoided above all. Otherwise, everything would be just a joke.